Good afternoon, everyone. This is Brendan DeSetti from the Software and Information Industry Association. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for uh, our new webinar here, Privacy 101 for Educators and School Officials. Um, really glad that everyone could join us uh, today for this. Um, the goal of this webinar is to provide an opportunity for school officials and educators um, to hear about what's going on in the privacy world, what's the conversation that's happening in state houses around the country, uh, and to really start to understand what does it mean uh, for you as you're considering different technology solutions to implement in the classroom or for school management purposes um, to, to start to think about this, um, this conversation and what it means down at the local level. Uh, so thank you all for joining again today. There is going to be an opportunity for Q&A with our speakers. Uh, there is a chat box in the lower left-hand side of the screen that you'll see there. So please uh, feel free at any time throughout the presentation to submit questions that you might have. Uh, we'll um, uh, do our best if we can to uh, address them in context or, uh, with our presentations, but we'll have an opportunity to uh, have that sort of moderated for us at the end uh, with the Q&A session. Uh, again, that's in the lower left-hand side. Everyone's muted today, so there won't be any voice action, but this uh, um, uh, webinar is being recorded, and we'll make an archive available to everyone after the fact, uh, hopefully tomorrow, and I'll send a message out to all the attendees. It will be hosted on the SIIA website, uh, which is SIIA.net. Uh, and that's a great segue into who's hosting this uh, webinar today. This is a, a three-way three hosting uh, webinar with uh, SIIA, the Education Technology Industry Network, more specifically, uh, of SIIA, and uh, AASA, the School Superintendents Association, along with the National Association of State Boards of Education. Um, so thank you to both NASB and AASA for their help in putting this webinar together. Hopefully it's a great resource for everyone as they're moving forward with uh, selecting technology solutions. Our speakers today are Amelia Vance, the Director of Education Data and Technology with the National Association of State Boards of Education. Amelia is a fantastic wealth of or fountain of knowledge when it comes to um, privacy issues. Uh, she's been following um, student data privacy since the issue first started popping up in the state houses in 2013, and she's really done a great job keeping up with everything and uh, keeping the industry and education stakeholders uh, up to date with the latest information. So really uh, grateful to have Amelia with us today. Uh, I'll also be presenting, again, my name is Brendan Desetti. I'm the Director of Education Policy here at SIIA. Uh, SIIA is the leading trade association for software and digital content publishers and software providers within the education sector. Um, and we're really happy to be talking with you today uh, at, the, at the local level. And then we also have um, Vincent Shivert, who's joining us from Albemarle County Public Schools here in Virginia. Uh, Vincent is the uh, Chief Information Officer for the school district and has uh, first-hand ex experience with um, evaluating and implementing technology solutions for classroom and, and district management. So we're really glad to have everyone here. We have uh, sort of a federal, state, local level experts on the phone today. Um, so please, again, if you have questions for any of these folks who are joining us, uh, use the chat box on the lower left-hand side of the screen. And with that, I want to hand things over to Amelia, who's going to give us a, an overview of, of sort of the context of what's going on today and uh, what are some of the trends happening in state law. So Amelia, take it away. Absolutely, and thank you, Brendan, and thanks to ASA and Vince for co-hosting this webinar today. I'm really excited to talk with all of you about this issue, which has really swept across the country um, over the past few years. So first of all, people always ask, why on earth is the National Association of State Boards so involved um, in this issue? So I always like to um, give the first statistic that 37 state boards of education have at least some authority over education data privacy, whether that's making the rules and regulations, whether it's serving on the SLDS board of their state. Um, so we try to make sure that state boards have enough information from national organizations, from industry, from privacy groups, and from many school officials officials like all of you in order to um, ensure that they have the best possible information in order to make decisions. 
So the first thing to really consider as we're looking at the laws that have passed across the country is why they happened. Um, many of you already know this, so I'll just touch on it briefly, but there were many news articles, many parent and privacy groups that began to raise intense concerns over the past couple years about various student privacy issues. Um, and some of the main ones that we saw was um, the scope and type of student data that schools collect, especially as we're moving into a personalized learning environment where more data is required in order to really personalize learning for that student. Um, it, who is collecting and accessing the student data and education records, so making sure that the only people who are accessing student data are the people who need it for their jobs. And tied to that very closely is the large, much larger number of third-party service providers that now have access to student data um, either because they are the storage house, as we'd sort of think of it in the physical realm, um, for this data or because they're running the school's email service or because they're a math game that students play in the classroom. So there was a lot of concern about what the regulations were about these third parties. We also saw a lot of conflation between student data and worries about the Common Core State Assessment um, and also the Common Core Standards. And um, finally, sort of this amorphous idea of the cloud. What is this <laughs> really um, hypothetical concept that so many of us are giving our data to? So there was really a lack of information about what exactly this meant and about how protected student data really was. So since 2013, 35 states have passed student data privacy laws. So we've seen a massive amount of efforts being made across the country. There have been 338 bills introduced in 49 states just since the beginning of 2014. Um, and most of these states have passed laws that are based on one of two models. The first model is a real governance model, so figuring out, okay, who has access to this data at the school level? How is it being secured? Are teachers being trained on how to protect this data, such as, you know, simple steps like locking a computer, um, and making sure that there's someone in charge and someone to answer questions. There was also a real high level of transparency in a lot of these laws requiring that states post what data elements were being collected on the state website or that there be um, some sort of FAQ available. Um, there was also a reiteration of parental rights. So there are really, there's one major federal law that governs student data, and apologies for those of you who know this already, um, FERPA, which was passed in, I believe, the 1970s. So it's slightly out of date when it comes to dealing with these digital technologies, and there have been sort of continuous patches put on the law by the federal government, by Congress, in order to ensure that the law stays up to date. That makes it very hard to understand, and even though FERPA actually does cover things like, for example, companies advertising to students, not everyone understood this because it wasn't written in a language that anyone other than a lawyer could understand. So for that, um, a lot of states pass laws explicitly saying things like you can't advertise to students or here's how you must be transparent so people know these things. So as I mentioned, there were two models that were passed across the country. So the first was the governance model I was just discussing, and the second was more focused on these third-party companies that were holding um, this data in order to help schools either analyze the data to find patterns or to hold the data so the school could access it um, or the numerous other functions that companies held. Um, so 19 states have introduced a bill based on this 
first governance model, which originated in Oklahoma with something called the Student Data Act in 2013. And nine states passed a law that was modeled on that. Um, the other law that was the main model came out of California and is known as SOPIPA. So as I mentioned, these laws really had these two common threads of school, district, and state governance on one hand, and companies and industry governance on the other. Um, but they also dealt with answering these particular questions. So about the collection of data. How is the data gathered? What types of data are gathered? Is parental consent necessary? Um, access who could see the data and who can use it. Um, so making sure that the federal government can only see, for example, aggregate data to, for example, ensure that um, African American students are not being disproportionately um, suspended in a school district, but they wouldn't have the information about an individual student. Um, similarly, the state is much more likely to have aggregate information about students um, in order to see those sorts of trends and see how districts or schools compare to each other. Um, districts are more likely to have personally identifiable information in order to see, okay, does this child have the special education plan that they need in order to succeed? Um, and then making sure that researchers who help make sure that education is evidence-based, um, have access to just the data they need in order to perform that research without endangering privacy. And then finally, looking at sort of the sharing aspect of these bills. So who can a school district export the data to? Um, so if there's a community organization or if there's a tutor that a parent wants to have access to the child's data, are they able to do that sort of thing? So to read a lot of the articles about student data um, in newspapers or online, you would think that there really hadn't been much of a structure around student data prior to 2013. However, both the new laws that were passed and several hundred older laws in states already gave state education agencies and state boards authority to make rules on student privacy, to um, adopt and implement privacy policies, to appoint chief privacy officers, to notify parents of rights. Um, so it, it's really important when looking at what your state has or when you have questions um, about what laws or policies you should be following that you look specifically about not only what is new within the past couple of years, but also what regulations may exist from 10 or 20 years ago. Some states have really excellent privacy um, regulations or laws, but haven't passed anything in the last three years. But that doesn't mean they don't have adequate privacy protections. So we've seen a few um, problematic trends as states have passed new privacy laws over the past few years. So first of all, we've seen some accidental consequences. So some states um, were so concerned about um, protecting privacy that they didn't consider the positive things that data can do for the classroom or for students. So for example, we had some unworkable requirements like kindergarten teachers being not allowed to talk to first grade teachers. Or um, in one particular state, districts thought that they were unable under the law that passed to hang student artwork in the hallways or to have student elections or um, to nominate students for scholarships without getting an explicit opt-in signed form from each of those children's parents, which disadvantaged a lot of um, um, minority students or disadvantaged students. Um, we've also seen some researcher restrictions. So some states have said that they don't want researchers to access anything other than aggregate data, which has led to issues with um, surveys that allow states to target resources, such as drug prevention programs or things like that. Um, and we've also seen a few bills um, that thankfully haven't really passed 
dealing with either defunding the statewide longitudinal data system or conflating data privacy with anti-assessment or anti-common core legislation. Finally, one of the big accidental consequences we've seen that I briefly touched on is this, um, this conversation about either having, allowing students to opt out or opt in to student data collection. So as I mentioned, there was one state that where because the law said that parents had to opt in to any sharing of information, several students were unable to get access to the state's scholarship fund. Um, so it's really important when people are considering what they want in their laws to ensure that they are considering maybe who might not be included, the equity consequences or any other potential consequences of those terms. Um, similarly, when it comes to legislation, words matter. So having ambiguous terms or um, terms where everyone in the legislature might agree about what something means but it's not spelled out in the law is causing some trouble in states as districts and schools are trying to figure out exactly what these things mean. And then finally, we've seen some implementation difficulties as um, either states haven't provided guidance or um, districts are confused or don't have the resources in order to implement some of the more restrictive laws around the country. So there are also a lot of really great trends that have gone across states, or at least interesting trends that may work better. So for example, the governance provisions, such as setting up a longitudinal data board in states that don't have that, or ensuring training um, have been really great things that we've seen out of the laws in the past couple years. Um, we've also seen some interesting provisions around disciplinary record or medical records, which are considered especially sensitive. So you have a lot of people who are concerned about um, keeping those records separate so they don't affect a child's um, long-term job or college prospects. And some states, such as New Jersey, actually separate those records from the standard student record in order to ensure that breaches are much less likely. One of the big things that we've heard frequently is that penalties are not strong enough under federal or state laws right now if someone explicitly violates the law and exploits student information. So many of the laws have decided to add penalties, whether financial or criminal. Um, but sort of going back to perhaps maybe accidental consequences under law, some of the laws are written broadly enough that even a teacher who accidentally leaves their computer unlocked could be held liable if student information gets into the wrong hands. So it's really essential that states are very careful as they put together these penalties. And then finally, as I mentioned, we have these laws aimed at vendors in particular, which was something that we had not seen before this 2014 California set of laws that restricted what companies could do with the information they obtained through vendor contracts with schools. I won't go into these laws too much right now, since I know many of you know about them, but I'm happy to discuss them in the Q&A or um, after the conference if anyone wants to contact me. And then finally, it's important to remember that laws are not the only form of law. So what's passed in the legislature is not the only thing that protects student information. So we've seen a ton of regulations and guidance and executive orders and resolutions that have the force of law and have been used in order to ensure that student information is protected while also balancing that with the important use of data and technology in the classroom. And then uh, I wanted to include this um, just because many experts have sort of agreed that these sorts of foundational elements of a privacy and security policy are really essential, whether at the state, district, or school level. So knowing why a law or policy exists, um, selecting someone in charge, having a transparency plan or a vendor plan, um, having a security plan and having training is absolutely essential. About 74% of breaches generally incur from in-house. So it's really important to make sure that staff know things like you have to lock your computer or you have to 
be careful where you put that flash drive, or you should be extra careful that you're not attaching the wrong thing to an email in order to ensure that the laws that are passed actually are enforced on the ground. So what's next? In 2016, we already have 40 bills related to student data privacy um, that have been introduced in 18 states. Um, and one of the new things that we've seen is um, some new bills that were, are based on a model by the ACLU that take into account privacy when it comes to one-to-one -to -one devices in the classroom or social media account privacy. We also have some potential new federal um, laws that could happen over the next year. So in particular, a rewrite of FERPA. Um, has the potential to move forward, and another separate bill that deals with the industry and privacy um, may also move forward over the next um, year. So it's good to keep an eye on that. And then finally, implementation is probably the biggest watchword of 2016. So many states have just begun implementing the laws that they passed over the, next, the past couple years. So it's very important that as your state implements new legislation or as your state considers um, passing new policies or legislation, that you keep an eye out on what is happening um, and convey to state policymakers what's working and what might not be working quite as well. And that concludes my presentation for today. Um, there are various data privacy resources that NASB has available, and I'm more than happy to talk with all of you um, after the meeting if you have particular questions about a particular state's laws or um, anything else. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Brendan. Thank you, Amelia. You know, as someone who follows privacy legislation and, and all of this, this stuff on a, on a daily basis, it's still amazing to hear it uh, all laid out there. So as you can tell, there really is, or as you just heard, there really is just so much activity going on right now. And the, the purpose of this webinar is really to help you cut, help, help cut through all that to understand what's important, what are some of the trends that, uh, that we're seeing. So Amelia pointed out a lot there. Um, but as we've had all these questions come up, we had um, the in bloom stuff that happened in New York. We have um, a lot of the questions coming up about Common Core and about state longitudinal data systems and to help um, sort of cut through what, what's actually happening uh, and to get through over, uh, to get over some of these fears that are out there about what's going on with student data. Um, the industry ha has undertaken a, a few st um, uh, proactive steps to sort of get out there some positive information about what's actually happening and what's actually not happening uh, with student information in the education space. Um, we strongly believe as an industry that student information is, is very important and is uh, equally important to protect that information from falling into the wrong hands and from being used for inappropriate purposes. Um, we see that there, there is a strong framework under FERPA, under COPPA, and PPRA, those are federal uh, privacy laws. There's this strong framework for protection that, that currently exists, but uh, we've recognized that as technology has changed and as uh, we're, we're moving forward a, a quite rapidly in, in this new era of education that um, there is this need for this ongoing review and improvement of policies and practices. Um, and so what we've done, uh, one of the first uh, projects that we undertook back in 2014 was to develop a uh, best practices guide for service providers. Uh, and this is a great thing for um, uh, school officials, educators to have to sort of start as a base point of, of what's actually going on and, and what are some of the questions that should be asked uh, when looking at new technologies. And it covers uh, five areas. One is, uh, the, or the first one, is using um, data for uh, only for educational purposes. So we have, we've heard these concerns of, you know, what are they doing? Are they taking data and they're using it over here for who knows what, some sort of commercial purpose. Um, the best practice in the industry and, and what's happening right now is that school service providers are they're collecting, using, and sharing student uh, information only for the educational and related purposes for which they were engaged uh, by the in educational institution or as they're directed by the educational institution. Um, we're also uh, looking at greater transparency uh, and ensuring that there's uh, a really a well-known or, or a uh, a layman's terms privacy policy out there that everyone, a school official, a lawyer, a parent, a student could read and really understand what's happening with student information, what's being collected, what's not being collected. 
uh, and what's coming for directly from the student and, and what's being submitted by the school. Um, the other one is, is uh, the third one here is using data only for purposes for which you're contracted uh, or you're directed by the school uh, or for which you get consent from the parents. So if you're doing something um, uh, that's education related that, you're, that the school's helping you do that and they've asked you to do that. Uh, four is maintaining security policies and procedures to, to protect the student information. Uh, you know, that's one of the biggest, bigger fears as well is uh, if you're collecting this information, are you uh, protecting it to the appropriate level that uh, the information deserves? Um, and you're not just having it out there for, for all to see. Uh, five, maintaining it, uh, this last one here is maintaining a data breach policy for notification to uh, educational institutions and then supporting the, their notification to individual and affected students. So you can see that this is just the baseline that we set out there in 2014. Uh, we still heard a lot of chatter coming out then, uh, in 2014 and a lot of uh, state bills still coming out, specifically targeted vendors and what uh, should and should not be happening. Uh, so we, we went another step further with another group called the Future Privacy Forum, which is a think tank on privacy issues here in DC. Uh, and we created the Student Data Privacy Pledge, which you can see at www.studentprivacypledge.org. Uh, and this came out of uh, a sort of a thinking group with uh, two U.S. congressmen, uh, Jared Polis from um, Colorado and Luke Messer from Indiana, to sort of see how we can have the industry be more transparent about what's going on and to, and to do a little bit of self-regulation. Um, so we worked with uh, FPF and we put together this privacy pledge which was announced on, in October 2014. Uh, we initially had uh, 14 companies sign on and when I checked this morning, uh, we had uh, 240 companies who have signed on to this pledge. And what it is is a set of six things that uh, the industry will do and six things the industry won't do uh, when interacting with student information and, and working with school districts. Uh, and, and the interesting part of this is that it um, puts a little bit of skin in the game. So companies who sign this pledge, it is a voluntary pledge, um, they, they're coming under the FTC's regulation and they're, and they're looking at penalties if they, if they violate it. So Amelia touched on that a little bit is that there are concerns that current law doesn't have enough teeth. Well, this is uh, an, an attempt by the industry to say here's what we're doing and we're willing to have a little bit more teeth and a little bit more skin in the game uh, versus what's going on right now where under FERPA, um, it's really the schools who have all the, uh, who, who are bearing responsibility and the vendors are helping the schools meet their responsibilities. And this sort of flips it around a little bit. So the goal is, uh, with the privacy pledge, is to build trust, to really be clear about what's happening and what's not happening, and to uh, put those details down on paper so that we can show wh uh, what we're doing. It's meeting federal expectations and it's going beyond that to meet some of those state laws as well. Uh, and, and the pledge applies to school service providers that uh, uh, are not just the traditional, I have a paper contract, it's signed with the right people, but it's also anyone who designs an application uh, for the education market and puts it out there. So we're really expanding about beyond what FERPA had originally envisioned and, and getting at some of those other companies and, and service providers that are operating in the marketplace right now. But again, it's, it is done on a voluntary basis, um, so it's uh, it only affecting those um, uh, companies who do sign the pledge right there. Uh, who have signed the pledge, and you can see everyone who signed the pledge online. So what are we doing? What are we talking about here when we do this pledge? And, and these are things that you should be asking if you're, if you're looking at a, uh, a particular service provider or a company to come do something with your school. These are the things that we should be looking at and asking questions for those who have or have even have not um, signed the privacy pledge. Uh, it's do not collect, maintain, or use student personal information beyond what you're authorized to or you've been asked to by the school or by the parent. Uh, don't sell student personal information. Now there is an exception there for if your uh, company is sold to another company, but uh, there's still a requirement within the pledge and within current law that um, that, pr that information still maintains the same protections under current law and, and under this pledge. Uh, not using or disclosing student information collected through the uh, educational service for targeted advertising. A big concern that we're hearing from in, in the state laws and we hear from uh, advocates on privacy and parents all over the country is that student information is being used for targeted advertising. This is very clear that there won't be any targeted advertising uh, and this is backing up current law on the federal side that uh, targeted advertising is prohibited uh, no matter what. Uh, not building a personal profile of a student other than for the educational purpose uh, that you've been contracted or that you've been asked to do by the school or by the parent. Uh, not making material changes to privacy policies without providing that prominent notice to the account holder and allowing them the opportunity 
uh, to make their own choice about whether to continue with that product or not. And then uh, finally on the do nots, do not uh, knowingly retain student personal information beyond the time period required to support that uh, purpose or as otherwise authorized by the parent. So that's six do nots. And then we have on the flip side six do's. Uh, we will collect information, but only for the purpose authorized by the institution. We will disclose clearly in contracts or privacy policies in an easy-to-read manner for parents to understand the types of information being collected and for the purposes for which it's being maintained. Uh, so we will support access and correction of student personal information by the parent, uh, either through the school or directly if that information is collected directly from the parent. Uh, we will maintain a comprehensive security program uh, to protect security and privacy of the student, uh, from unauthorized access and disclosure. Uh, we will require our vendors uh, to, uh, who, who have access to the personal information for school purposes uh, that they'll be obligated to the same commitments for the given PI. And uh, finally on the do list, uh, we will allow, um, uh, this goes back to the do not sell, but if there is a sell, uh, selling of the company or a merger, it's not the selling of the information, but a, a merger of the company is that that, that company will uh, the successor entity will be held to the same standards for that data that's been collected. So these are six do's, six don'ts uh, under the privacy pledge signed by 240 companies of, of what's going on, uh, what, what's actually happening and what will not happen uh, in the student uh, data in the education marketplace. And uh, we put this out there and it lines up with a lot of the state laws that have come into place uh, modeled after SOPIPA that um, Amelia talked about there, we had quite a few states who have passed laws model on this legislation. And what SOPIPA says um, is uh, companies will not knowingly uh, sell information uh, except for the merge, except in the case of a merger. Uh, they will not target advertising to students using student information. They will not uh, build or maintain a profile except for K-12 school purposes. And they uh, are um, given a lot of restrictions on how uh, student information can be disclosed to other parties. Um, so the pledge is intended to sort of get at all of those, those things that's going on there. So these are, uh, it's a great opportunity right here to use the student privacy pledge as um, sort of a guideline for looking at new products. What are some questions that you should be asking to, um, to service providers as they're coming on board or you're thinking about adopting their products? Uh, and then uh, ongoing efforts that are still continuing in the industry, still building up that uh, schools and parents should be aware of is the first and foremost is higher levels of transparency within uh, on data use and data protection. Um, and that comes through uh, easier to read privacy policies uh, and other communications from companies. So really having easy to read things for parents, for students, for school service providers on uh, what a, a particular product is doing with student data, what they're not doing with student data, and how they're protecting it. So I, I included two links there to, um, one is to Clever who has a privacy policy that's uh, really easy to follow, uh, to read and move, maneuver around and really understand what's going on there. And the other one is a link to a, a, a additional resource from a company called Text Help. Uh, just on what they're doing. So in addition to the privacy policy, just putting out a little bit more information there, making it really easy to understand why they're doing certain things and why they uh, aren't doing certain things. Um, putting it out there, and it's uh, very helpful for school administrators who are thinking about adopting types of product like that. Um, so I would encourage you to look at that uh, and to search any product that you're doing and see if they have these additional resources. And as we continue in this privacy discussion, we'll see more companies um, start to do this and start to engage in this higher level of transparency. Um, the other thing that we're seeing coming up is a proactive development of a culture of privacy within a whole organization. And what we're talking about there is uh, the idea that privacy is uh, built into a company. It's not a feature added after the fact, but it's something when there's an idea that arises within a company, um, they, they, at, the, at that genesis moment, they start to think, okay, now how do we build privacy into this product? And then outside of the technical side, how are we training our employees that are coming on board to understand what privacy is and the importance of privacy? And how are we training everyone from top level management to technical developers to even the customer service reps on what privacy is with this company and how we can uh, communicate that with uh, internally and externally? And the other thing is companies are, are becoming much more ready uh, to answer questions from school districts about how they're protecting student information and what they're doing if they sign the pledge, how are they meeting those pledge requirements. And so there, here are a couple questions that, uh, that you can have on hand just to uh, shoot over to uh, potential service providers. Um, you know, if they've signed the pledge, I put, in, I put a note right here, if you sign the pledge, it's a great start. 
um, for your research and, and different products or companies you should be interested in, but it's certainly not an end game. Uh, the privacy pledge, uh, the best practices document, all this is just um, great questions and things to be asking uh, your service providers to really make sure that they're following through on their commitments. Um, you know, are they not targeting advertising? Are they collecting only the information that they've been contracted to? Uh, are they providing opportunities when uh, there's substantial changes to the privacy policy for uh, new consent to be given? Um, so that's a, a really great spot um, to look for questions that you can be asking uh, to your service providers. And I saw a question at the beginning. Um, are there any efforts to help states actually implement these privacy laws that are coming out? Um, the, the short answer is uh, nothing official. <laughs> and, and I say that because, so PIPA was the first, obviously it was, it's the model for lots of states that it introduced and passed legislation in 2015, uh, but so PIPA just went into effect in January 2000, 2016, just went into effect uh, last month. Uh, and we haven't seen anything official come out there. We are. Um, looking forward to some draft um, sort of best practices slash things you should be doing as a vendor uh, to be ready to be in compliance with this law, but nothing has come out um, as of yet that is official. So we don't have anything right now, but what we do have are the privacy pledge and uh, these best practices that are out there um, that are helping guide what companies are doing in the meantime before anything official comes out. Um, so that's what's sort of happening uh, right now from the industry standpoint. Uh, and with that, I want to hand it over to Vince, who is going to talk to us about what's going on at the local level and what all these changes for vendors and for um, uh, governance means uh, for a chief information officer. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Vince Scheibert. I'm the chief information officer for Abemal County Public Schools. Uh, my primary duties uh, revolve around, I oversee what we call the Department of Accountability research and technology. Um, Abemal County is a, um, it's a diverse community uh, located in Central Virginia. We have about 726 square miles in the county inside of which is, uh, resides Charlottesville, Virginia, home of the University of Virginia. So in and around that area we have a, a pretty uh, pretty urbanized area, and then we, we quickly drift off into, into rural uh, or heavily rural areas. But we have about 14,000 students and, and about 2,500 staff. Um, and the, the concept of the idea of student data is, is really perplexing uh, right now for us. Uh, companies and software manufacturers and app developers, you know, they're making really cool things and, and these really cool apps and software pieces or web parts that, that, that we have access to and the capability of being able to use, uh, most of them are directly targeted to teachers. And, and teachers are, are teachers, most of them aren't lawyers. So the idea of uh, how do we help teachers ascertain whether or not something is appropriate going to be appropriate um, is, a, is a major challenge. Uh, we, can, we just recently did a, a complete rewrite of our responsible use policy for our staff. Um, as part of it, we, we wrapped in uh, ideas and, and pieces around um, being familiar with FERPA, being familiar with COPA, being familiar with uh, local policies that we have around copyright in different p in different areas um, like that, and it's a challenge. It, it's a challenge because our teachers kind of put the kids at kind of put the kids first. Well, this is really going to help a kid, and then as we kind of delve into it. So one of the things that we've done to be able to help our teachers and our administrators um, is we put together a matrix of almost like a mini decision tree that that our teachers can kind of walk through. Um, to be able to say whether something is, is okay to use or, or do they need more information and more support. Uh, our division has developed a, a localized resource adoption policy, so that means principals have the authority to say something is a learning resource and bring it in. Um, so how we coach principals up and how we coach teachers up to be able to analyze and decide 
Um, but it, as, as teachers work through our decision tree, um, if at any point they hit a flag, they have the ability to then turn that over to our educational technology team uh, and then myself if, if there are further complications. Um, and that has been the, for as much uh, I think as we talk about FERPA in, in education, I think the, the misunderstandings of, of what's in it um, and what its requirements are and how you go about educating staff who probably think they know, but they, they seem to really not know um, what those aspects are. Um, so we held a, a series of meetings with staff uh, as we rolled out their responsible use policy and the changes it, it included. And the piece that we, we kind of started to talk to our, our teachers about is the idea of them being the primary custodian of student data initially. And as they start to prepare and move things through or sign kids up or request kids sign up for different accounts on different sites, whether it's uh, like Kia or Kahoot or the, anything that teachers are using that's really cool, we start to kind of circle back into the real life pieces of what information are we really sharing um, and how are we sharing it. And most recently we came up to a situation with our athletic directors. So our athletic directors utilize a service that really allows them to be able to manage their games, be able to manage uh, communication with staff, post pictures of kids, all that really cool stuff, and, and it makes life very easy for them. But the one aspect that they didn't necessarily realize, because they're athletic directors, not lawyers, when they read, is they actually gave away the copyright of the student image as they posted the as they as they posted the photo of the um, the student. And inside of FERPA, it kind of has escalating pieces of personally identifiable information as as school divisions, we are the personally identifiable information folks. We have it all. Um, and as we kind of put in the directory information in for our athletic groups, and then we add in height and weight, which kind of ratches it up and starts to move into that personally identifiable information. And then when we put the student's photo and likeness and, and attach it to it, we, we accelerate way up that level or that threshold of of scrutiny and, and that was the part that we just recently just kind of came back to with our athletic directors about how we were going to handle that moving forward and, and kind of we were in violation of some of our own policies uh, around that. But I think as you take a look at what's going on with the state level, uh, we certainly heard or the, the um, California legislation really shined a, a heavy light on um, on Google at that point with um, their use of student information in, this, in, the, in Google Drive. Um, I think it's also equally important to look at your own local policies, your school division policies, to see what kind of old language is sitting out there that, that allows or doesn't allow um, the sharing of information. So as part of our matrix, circling back to it, as part of our matrix, and, and I'll post all this in the chat window um, in a second, we have the form that parents can go, uh, not parents, we have the form that teachers can send home to get parental acceptance. So at the point we go through all those different checks and balances and we think it's okay in terms of um, student privacy, we don't think there's personally identifiable information, or if we do, we, we see it as something we would want or find to be necessary. Um, the final piece goes into the parental sign-off to where a teacher then has the ability to, and again, using all of the necessary requirements to get parental permission. So you need to have items like a, a link to the, to the privacy. You need to have a link to the security. You need to have how they're going to use this information, how this website or the teacher is going to use this information, and what information is going to be released by the parent accepting it. So if you don't have that information, you're not actually complying with FERPA as it stands, and you're already off on the bad foot. So um, that's kind of been the, what we wanted to be able to do is 
provide our teachers the most flexible learning space and, and learning environment um, possible, but do it in a safe and reasonable way. Um, and for us, it, it really came down to the construction of this, this matrix, this decision matrix for them to be able to assess uh, learning resources and be able to bring them in. And then what we do uh, certainly around that, that concept is once we have determined a application, web tool, app, et cetera, we warehouse that for one year, kind of going along with the, the notion of everybody takes a look at their, their privacy at least once a year to be able to ensure that that item or that service is still as acceptable next year as it was when we adopted it. Um, so there are the little things that we've tried to do uh, and to be able to address student privacy. I know, a lot of, um, I know a lot of effort is kind of put at the state level and, and really wrapping it around, but for me at the school division level, my greatest concern isn't the, all the stuff sitting behind firewalls in different places along those lines. It's the areas to where our teachers are, because again, I'm one school division in, in Virginia, and we have 2,500 teachers that have the ability to make decisions to do things either the right way or potentially the wrong way without, without guidance. Um, so that's a lot of potential. So what we, we focus on is how do we coach up our staff and how do we provide a structured capability to our staff to be able to make the best decision possible. And with that, Brandon and Amelia, I appreciate uh, the things that you've said and laid out, and, and I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks, Vince. And if anyone has a question, uh, again, please check out the, the chat box on the lower left-hand side. If you want to just uh, jot something down and, and uh, send it over, we will ask it of our, of our panelists here. Um, so I did see one that came in, and it, and it did get, uh, Amelia, you answered it uh, in the chat box, but I wanted, it was a great question, so I want to just uh, bring it up again. The question was, if a vendor has fully implemented the, pl uh, the student privacy pledges provisions, does that ensure that the vendor is compliant with all of the different state and federal laws? And Amelia answered and, and did so correctly is the answer is, is no. So the privacy pledge was not uh, written specifically towards any of the state laws. Um, and so some of the state laws differ, just uh, they, they vary a little bit. But what the, the privacy pledge is, it's a, um, it does have several provisions that are um, similar to provisions that are in some of the SOPIPA bills. So if a state has adopted a SOPIPA piece of legislation then, and they sign the privacy pledge, um, then the next step is to say, okay, let me go into the privacy pledge or go into their privacy policy and just make sure that I uh, double check and make sure that they're in compliance. Or you can um, uh, ask the, um, the provider as well if they're compliant and how they're doing so. Uh, for instance, um, uh, Maryland no, knows, uh, or excuse me, Georgia is no uh, behavioral targeted advertising is prohibited in the state law. Uh, behavioral tag targeted advertising is prohibited in the student privacy pledge. Um, so it's a great place to start with that research and say, okay, I'm looking for something, uh, uh, a product if the company signed the privacy pledge, I know that they're meeting a certain threshold. Now I just have to go through and just double check to make sure that they're meeting any last pieces that my state requires. Um, and, uh, and all these companies are very um, interested in providing that information to you. So ask the questions. Don't be shy about it. Um, and I'm curious, uh, Vince, uh, if, if your district uh, uses the privacy pledge, or is that, is that a starting point for when you're looking at different products, or um, do you look at some of those provisions at all? So we do. So we, um, when we're bringing new vendors in, we'll certainly take a look at that, um, and we'll, we'll want to, uh, to ask those questions. Uh, and then somebody else posted something else that we use uh, around the I Keep Safe piece. Um, a big piece for us also actually when, we, when we're into high level negotiations about contracts and different systems that, that I'm bringing in, um, the bigger piece that we'd like to be able to take a look at is actually the, um, while we like to think our contract and our, our vendor relationships will last forever, um, we know that's not likely. So we also add in provisions around the destruction or return of um, the data that we have supplied. So that's usually part of our contracts 
as well. So that it's kind of a, a different spin on our separation of service uh, piece that a lot of people don't necessarily include. So at that point, then I'm up, I make it the vendor's responsibility or hope that the vendor um, gets rid of it. And we know that doesn't always happen as it should. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and another question came in for you. Uh, well, let me uh, ask, answer this other question. Are there incentives for companies to sign the pledge? Um, the only incentive is that um, they can say that they signed the pledge, and it, uh, in some districts, um, like Vince was saying, that it can be a starting point. So if a company hasn't signed the pledge, maybe they won't uh, look at their product right away. Um, but that's the only type of incentive. There isn't anything else really out there. The companies don't get a leg up in procurement really uh, because there's still a, a process at the local level to actually make sure and verify that um, a, a company is, is uh, meeting those, those pledge commitments. Uh, but Vince, what does your training look like for teachers in using the matrix for decision making? Um, and how are you educating teachers about what the greatest concerns are? That you, know, you pointed some, some of the greatest concerns out. So how do you educate your teachers to what those are? Sure. So every year back, so uh, let's start with our new teachers. So new teachers coming in as part of their new teacher orientation, um, we, we include uh, this as a, uh, as a module when we're handing them their, their as we're distributing the technolo their technology. So we'll include it there. Um, and then annually every year we, we meet with the buildings uh, or staff will meet with the, our ed tech teams will meet with the buildings to kind of refresh. Because what we do is we require teachers on an annual basis to get uh, parental sign-offs on uh, different web resources and different web tools that the school, that that individual teacher would want to uh, utilize. So at that point they're holding these little groups uh, that typically work through the PLCs, the personal, um, the professional learning communities in and around um, the schools or the division. And we, we just kind of hone in on it and then we hone in on the specifics. So part of it is, and I don't know if it'll be available, but the, the template for parent permission is basically a, a, a Google Doc that teachers have the ability to save as their own and then just type in their individual information. So again, we try to make it as structured and as teacher friendly as possible um, to ensure that it's easy to comply. So if we make things difficult for teachers, there's almost 100% chance they're not going to comply with it. So we want to be able to make, sh make sure that it is easy for them to comply with uh, and it still gives them the flexibility to, to get the job done they, they think they need to do. Excellent, thanks. Uh, and Amelia, a uh, question for you. This one came in uh, a, little bit, a little bit ago. Can you highlight any training models or capacity building efforts to ensure that um, student data privacy laws are implemented effectively um, at the state or at the district or, or the classroom level? Absolutely. So I, I know you talked about this uh, a little bit in your presentation, Brendan, but unfortunately we haven't seen too much um, on the training side. There have only been, I believe, two, um, two sets of bills. So the recent ACLU model bills that I mentioned talk about um, the necessity of training. And then also um, the Georgia bill that was passed into law in 2015 talked about the importance of training as part of the job of the chief privacy officer in the state. So it, you have a lot of people who are sort of um, doing, as Vince mentioned, sort of coming up with things on a district by district level, um, and in some cases duplicating efforts. So unfortunately, there isn't really a good clearinghouse right now for um, people to come together. So it, what I would suggest for people who are looking for good training resources, um, NASB is doing some work with AACTE to talk about exactly what um, teachers and um, administrators and um, everyone else really needs to know on this. So if you have suggestions or experiences or sample forms from your district, school, or state, please share those um, with me. I'd definitely love to see them. Um, also, check out a lot of the other national organizations. So um, 
State Education Technology Directors Association, CETA, or um, Access for Learning in particular has had some great stuff where districts in a particular state, Massachusetts, Maine, Virginia, come together and um, have a website that anyone can access to see all of the information about vendors, but also coordinating on things like training. Vince, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I was squeaking in my, my chair. But the, oh. the, one thing that I would add, the one thing I would add in there is for any of you that are at a school division right now, either at the, the technical level or the superintendent level, you have to take this seriously. You're one of two people that will be named as part of any lawsuit moving forward. So they'll have Abemarle County Public Schools listed first as the big dog, but second will be the superintendent, and third will be me um, as, we, <laughs> as we start to go through it. So if, if at the upper division level you're not attending to it, I don't think you can have an expectation that your teachers will want to attend to it. So it's part of all of our ongoing communications with our building principals, um, as well as, as at the cabinet level about our, our security and our different pieces. And going back to the state, you know, as a school division, you're the primary custodian of this information when you hand it off to the state. And, and, and having had this role in a couple different states so far, I haven't had one yet that said, hey, we'll take responsibility of it after you hand off to us. Um, so you want to be able to push back on the state about how they, how they are dealing with student information that they are collecting and kind of demand some answers around it. Um, the amount of information that we pass to the state now is astronomical uh, compared to what it was three or four years ago. So just that concept of being diligent in, because at, after all, it's your data. Absolutely, and I, I would add as sort of models for people, I know West Virginia has been doing some really great work. I just wrote a publication on some of the transparency and training work that they've been doing um, where the state sort of has been doing both in-person and online training there. Um, Wisconsin, I have recently discovered, has the best student data privacy website of any state I have ever seen, which includes actually a short module for teachers um, for training with a really quick quiz afterwards. Um, so I definitely recommend all of you check that out, and I'll, I'll look up the URL and put it in the chat box. But um, definitely the more things you can identify, whether they're in your state, and you can send them to people like myself, people like Noel at AASA or Brendan, um, if you hear about great things that are happening, let us know so we can share them with all of the districts that are sort of trying to grow this from the ground up right now, or states that are trying to develop their own programs so we can share best practices across the country. That's really great. Uh, I know it's 4.59 and, and this is uh, scheduled to end at 5. I just had uh, two more things that I wanted to ask. First, for, uh, and, then, and then we'll end, so I hope folks will just um, tag on for one more minute or two. Um, for Amelia, we just had a really big reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, so there's going to be a lot of changes in the next year or two uh, coming down the pike uh, on all aspects of education in, in K-12. Um, but what are some implications for student data policy that might um, be changed a little bit here? if you have any. Absolutely. It, that's a really great question. So it, in order to sort of fit it into a 30-second format, um, I'm happy to go into this in more detail um, if anyone wants to contact me later. But um, so the Every Student Succeeds Act did not have really much of a student privacy focus to it. It originally did in some earlier language. Um, but the one section that wasn't there going back to training was um, an authorization that funds for training teachers about um, data and other things like that can now also explicitly be used for privacy. So that's now allowable under that law. However, the law does strongly implicate privacy because there are a lot more um, areas of data that can be collected, a lot more breakdowns. So it's absolutely essential that anyone who works with data in a school system and is dealing with the implementation of this law consider privacy as the other half to that equation in order to ensure that this new data that is required to be collected under the law is um, protected as it makes its way up. 
Thank you. That, and it's tough to fit that in in 30 seconds. And so the last thing I wanted to ask was, was Vince, if you had um, one recommendation for a, a, a superintendent or a CIO or a CTO who's uh, just beginning to think about implementing a, a technology review process, what's your, what's your one recommendation for, for the foundation of that program? If you have one, that might be a big question. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. So um, I, I think the, the first thing that, that you have to be able to do, and it's the first thing that we did, was try to get all the cows back in the barn. Um, you have to figure out what your teachers are already doing because teachers are creative, innovative folks. So they're trying to figure out ways to meet kids' needs. and. The best way to do that is you have to get out and you have to ask them and, and you kind of have to have that amnesty piece to be able to get everybody to comply with what they're already doing. From there, you can start to build solutions and resolutions and different pieces. But the first big thing you have to be able to do is to really figure out where people are and why they've gone there to be able to come up with a solution. And then from there, there's a million of templates that you could follow or different pieces. But I think the big thing that we do is we forget to ask, hey, why are they doing that and, where, and, and how did they get there to be able to, to figure out how to design a, a solution that will work for your division. Excellent. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Amelia and Vince for, for coming out today and providing your expertise. I put contact information up on the screen. If anyone has any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, so I will also post it on our website. I'll send a notification out to everyone who registered so you can check it out. Um, but thank you again as well to uh, AASA, the School Superintendents Association, and to NASBE, the State Boards of Education, uh, and to SIA, my organization, for all co-hosting this, this event. Uh, thank you for coming out, and I look forward to having you on another event in the future. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.